So our last talk for this morning will be by uh, Nathan Hilton, and it's about final schemes of the Turkey. Thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be back in Berkeley. Uh, this is all joint work with Melody Chan, who's sitting back there. Uh, she's giving a fabulous colloquium talk this afternoon, um, which I think doesn't conflict with any of the talks here. Uh, so uh, please go ahead and check that out. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about Fano schemes of determinants and permanents. Uh, so let's start out by looking at the space of singular matrices. Right? So what is this? Uh, I'm just looking, uh, so I'll denote this by D sub n. Uh, this consists of those n by n matrices over C, uh, which have vanishing determinant. Okay, so this is a hypersurface in matrix space Cn squared. It's cut out by the degree n determinant polynomial. So this is a basic object that we've been talking about all week long. Right? So just for example, we can look at D2, the space of singular 2 by 2 matrices. This is cut out by the polynomial x11, x22, minus x12, x21. And so what I'd like to start out talking about is the following question. What linear subspaces in matrix space in Cn squared are actually contained in this hypersurface of singular matrices? In other words, what are linear spaces of singular matrices? So this is really a, quite a classical question, and it's got some connections to geometric com complexity theory, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. But let's take a look at some examples first. OK, so here are two examples. Uh, the one on the left is probably the easiest example. So this is uh, an n minus 1 times n dimensional space of matrices. I'm looking at those matrices where I'm allowing anything I want uh, in the bottom n minus 1 rows, and I have zeros in the top row. Okay. And so if you look at the Laplace expansion of the determinant, you immediately see these are all singular matrices, so they're contained in my hypersurface dn. Okay. So this is our first example. This is an n minus 1 times n dimensional space of, linear, uh, of sing singular matrices. So the second example here on the right, uh, this is maybe a little more tricky. Uh, so here we have a five-dimensional linear space of matrices. I'm just zeroing out the upper left two by two block. And so we might ask, well, how do we, how do we see that these are all, in fact, singular matrices? So I can th think about these all as being linear maps from C3 to C3. And if I look at what they're doing, I see that the two-dimensional space spanned by my first two basis vectors is being compressed down to the one-dimensional space spanned by the third basis vector. Uh, so I'm compressing something two-dimensional down to something one-dimensional. That means each one of these maps has to be singular as well. So again, I now have a five-dimensional linear space of singular matrices. So I can do a similar construction uh, to get what is called a, a compression space. Uh, so what's, what's the setup here? Uh, and these, so these actually uh, sort of appeared in, in Veyman's talk. Um, I can take uh, an s-dimensional vector space W and an s plus one-dimensional vector space V. These are both subspaces of C to the n. And now I look at all those matrices which are mapping this s plus one-dimensional space V into the s-dimensional space W. Okay, so this is a linear condition on my matrices. So it gives me a linear subspace of matrices. And since I'm compressing something s plus one-dimensional, down to something s-dimensional, uh, this means that these, uh, th this is a singular linear map. Okay, so this gives me some linear subspace of dn, uh, which we'll call a compression space. Uh, and these are the linear spaces of singular matrices which are easy to understand. These are, these are somehow the ones that we have a good handle on. Okay. All right. So we've seen some examples of linear spaces of singular matrices. What's the connection to geometric complexity theory? Okay, so we're all uh, trying to understand uh, valiance conjecture, comparing the complexity of the permanent to the complexity of the determinant. And uh, so we have this geometric uh, approach to, due to Momoi and Sohoni um, that says what we really need to do is we need to understand the orbit closure of the determinant polynomial in this space of um, degree n polynomials and n squared variables. If we can somehow understand the, the, the boundary of this, uh, we'll be well on our way uh, to, to understanding valence conjecture. I mean, we need to understand something about the permanent too, but this, is, this would already be an immense step if we had a good idea of what this boundary was. Uh, and so uh, this is where these maximal linear subspaces of singular matrices come into play. Um, so there's an idea due to Landsberg, uh, Manivel, and Rasser um, that says, well, if you have a maximal linear subspace of singular matrices, you can actually use this to construct a curve in GLN squared, uh, 
And if you look at the, line, uh, the, the limiting behavior of this curve on your determinant polynomial, you're going to produce potentially some interesting piece in the boundary of the orbit closure of the determinant. Um, so they did this um, to produce, I guess, um, something, in the, uh, something that was previously unknown in the um, boundary of the orbit closure of the 3 by 3 determinant. So this is the connection to, uh, or at least one of the connections between linear subspaces of singular matrices uh, and this um, geometric complexity theory. So this is not really what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I just really like to focus on the question, what do we know about linear subspaces of singular matrices? OK, so as an algebraic geometer, I find that the most natural way of approaching this problem is through a, a parameter space called a Fano scheme. Uh, so what's the kth Fano scheme of my hypersurface dn? This is just going to be the set of all k plus 1 dimensional linear spaces which are contained in the hypersurface dn. Okay. So this is what this Fano scheme is as a set. Of course, this is naturally a subset of my Grassmannian GRK plus 1 n squared, which is parameterizing k plus 1 dimensional linear spaces in an n squared dimensional vector space. This thing has the structure of an algebraic variety. It turns out that this Fano scheme is a closed subset of this algebraic variety, so it can also think about it as an algebraic variety. Really, I should be thinking about it as a scheme. It potentially has some non-reduced structure. Um, but this isn't so important, so I'm going to gloss over this. OK, so my, my goal, really, in understanding linear spaces of singular matrices boils down to understanding what these Fano schemes look like for different values of k. Uh, and so really what I want to do is I want to study the geometry of these Fano schemes. All right, so I should mention, um, of course, if k is equal to 0, here I'm looking at one-dimensional uh, spaces of singular matrices. This is somehow uninteresting, right? Anytime I have a singular matrix, I can scale it by non-zero constants. Uh, this gives me a, a unique line of, um, of singular matrices. So things really become interesting when k is at least equal to 1. So let's look at maybe the first, first case. So here we're going to look uh, at planes of singular 2 by 2 matrices. Okay, so this is where k is equal to 1 and n is equal to 2. So we'd already seen one example of a plane of singular 2 by 2 matrices. This was on our second slide. And the example that we have just on the left here. I'm zeroing out the top row. Of course, uh, there's no reason that I couldn't transpose this and get a different plane of singular uh, 2 by 2 matrices. This is the second example that I have here. Okay, and of course, there are many more planes of singular 2 by 2 matrices which I have. Uh, I can act on uh, these two planes uh, by row and column operations uh, to get two different families. Um, so both of these families uh, are parameterized by two parameters. Uh, so on the left by lambda 0 and lambda 1, on the right by mu 0 and mu 1. And as long as both parameters don't simultaneously vanish, I'll indeed get a plane of uh, singular 2 by 2 matrices. And this plane, uh, it's actually just determined by the ratio between these two parameters. So these are two families which are both parameterized by my complex projective Y. So uh, I have a map from the disjoint union of two complex projective lines into this Fano scheme. And it actually turns out that this is everything. Every plane of singular 2 by 2 matrices is of the form that I have here in the middle of the slide. So this Fano scheme is just the disjoint union of two copies of P1. Uh, so topologically, it's the disjoint union of two spheres. We see that it's disconnected. And um, of course, this shouldn't come as, as a surprise at all, right? Uh, this hypersurface that I'm looking at is, if I, th if I think about it in projective space, this is just a, a non-singular quadric surface. We all know that any non-singular quadric surface has exactly two distinct rulings. These two components that I have are corresponding exactly to the two different families of lines that I have on this quadric surface. Any questions so far? Great, so let's move on to think about planes of singular n by n matrices. Uh, so this situation is already pretty well understood. Uh, so chronic or normal form, which gives a normal, normal form for pencils of matrices, implies, in fact, that any plane of singular n by n matrices uh, is actually going to be contained in some compression space. 
So these linear spaces of singular matrices, which we understand quite well, uh, we can use these to understand at least what all the points in these Fano schemes are. Right? This doesn't tell us yet so much about the geometry. So this is uh, my first contribution together with Melody. We can actually say something about the geometry of this Fano scheme. Uh, so our statement is that this Fano scheme F1 of dn parameterizing planes of singular n by n matrices, this has exactly n irreducible components. So we know exactly what these pieces are. And each one of these components has dimension 2 times n squared minus 2 minus n plus 1. So this is, this is the remarkable thing. They all have the same dimension. This might not be something that you would necessarily expect. Uh, and this dimension that they all have, uh, this is what's called the expected dimension. What does this mean? Anytime I have a Fano scheme of a hypersurface, uh, it's actually cut out by a section, the, the section of some vector bundle living on my Grassmannian. Uh, and the rank of, so the rank of this vector bundle is the number of conditions that this section is giving me. Uh, and we say that our, our Fano scheme has the expected co-dimension if the co-dimension in the Grassmannian is exactly the rank of this vector bundle. And well, expected dimension is defined in a similar fashion. Right? So somehow, what this is actually saying is that the behavior of planes uh, of singular matrices is exactly the same as you would expect if you're looking at planes uh, contained in any homogeneous, any hypersurface, any general hypersurface of degree n. So somehow with respect to two-dimensional linear spaces, the determinant is generic. Okay. But on the dimension, but if you have a uh, irreducible components, the fact to have uh, n irreducible... Yeah, okay, so it's, it's not entirely... Right, so, so for a generic hypersurface, of course, you'd expect that... Um, one component. That's right. So it's yes. So it, it's proper. This 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 you get the expected dimension. People call that proper. Yeah. yeah Are they all okay. smooth? So uh, no. So uh, they're not smooth. Uh, in fact, none of the components are smooth, except in the in the in the two by two case. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, and so some of these, these components we understand quite well because they're really all coming from these compression spaces. And so we, and for any component of this form, we can tell you exactly when it's smooth and when it's not smooth. Okay. This is connected for n bigger than two. Uh, yes. So for n bigger than two, it's connected. We'll get to that in a in a minute or two. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So. This is pretty good. We understand the case of planes of singular n by n matrices well. Uh, what can we tell us <coughs> what the components are? Yeah, so I mean, somehow the point is that. They're all just compression spaces? Yeah, they're, um, they're all coming from compression spaces. Okay. Yeah. So there's n different types of them. Right, so there's somehow n different types of compression spaces, and each one of these will give me a different irreducible component. That's maybe not immediately clear, but it's true. Hmm. And, yeah, so it's the different pairs, k and k plus 1. That's right. That's right. OK, so what can we say about higher dimensional linear spaces? Uh, maybe the first question we should ask is, well, what's the maximum dimension that a linear space of singular matrices can even have? Uh, so this was answered a while ago by Du Dunay, uh, who said that this Fano scheme fk of dn is non-empty if and only if k is less than n times n minus 1. In other words, the maximum dimension that a linear space of singular matrices can have is equal to n times n minus 1. We've already seen that this dimension is realized, right? This very first example that we had where we just zeroed out the first row of a matrix, this does the trick. The theorem says that you can't get anything of dimension higher than that. OK, so this was somehow the good news. This is what we understand. The rest of this slide is mainly bad news. Um, so if we're in this range where our Fano scheme is non-empty, but k is larger than 1, Lots of bad stuff happens. Uh, so this phenomenon that we had in the case of planes, where our Fano scheme had pure dimension, uh, this almost never will happen. Um, we have no real clue what the irreducible components are. So there's been some previous work on this, uh, which tells us what the irreducible components are when k is large relative to n. So this is work due to Beasley. And in the case of small matrices, so for n equals 3 or 4, there's some work by Atkinson and later Eisenbaud and Harris that tell us exactly what the components are. Um, there's some work by Jan Dreisma, which gives us another component uh, in, in some other cases. But in general, we really don't have an, a handle at all on what these components are. And this seems to be a very, very difficult problem. 
which unfortunately I can't say anything about either. Um, there are other bad things that happen too. So if you want to think about your Fano scheme really as being a scheme instead of being a variety, uh, in general, it's going to have non-reduced structure. This actually happens. Um, and it has really bad singularities. So uh, the, the geometry somehow is, is very complicated. Uh, so maybe it's, it's good to take a step back and ask slightly easier questions that we can actually answer. So one of these questions would be, well, when exactly is this Fano scheme connected? Uh, so this is, this is somehow a, a very natural thing to ask. These Fano schemes are special, example, special examples uh, of Hilbert schemes, uh, which are parameterizing some, um, uh, some sub-varieties with fixed Hilbert polynomial of a given projective variety. The classical Hilbert scheme, parameterizing sub-varieties with fixed Hilbert polynomial of projective space, is connected. This is due to uh, this classical result of Hartshorn. Uh, and so it, it really uh, is, is, is um, well motivated to ask, when is uh, this example of a Hilbert scheme, namely our, our Fano scheme, connected? Okay. So uh, Melody and I are able to provide a complete characterization for which values of k and n our Fano scheme is connected. So this behavior is largely governed by um, this quadratic polynomial, kappa of s. So here I have fixed n. And kappa of s is then equal to n squared minus n minus s times s plus 1 minus 1. Okay. So our theorem then says, well, let's take k to be in the range where our Fano scheme is non-empty. Then this Fano scheme is disconnected if and only if k is either between n, uh, k is larger than n squared minus 2n and less than or equal to kappa of 0, or there exists some integer s in between 0 and n minus 1 such that kappa of s minus the minimum of n minus s minus 1 and s is less than k, which in turn is less than or equal to kappa of s. Okay, so this is a mouthful. Uh, it seems like a rather complicated thing, but it's definitely something that tells you exactly when our Fano scheme is connected. So let's take a look and see what this is telling us for uh, low values of n. So we'd already seen that in the case n equals 2, our Fano scheme is these two dis disjoint copies of p1, so it's disconnected. For n equals 3, our Fano scheme, according to this theorem, will be connected if k is less than or equal to 3. For n equals 4, if k is less than or equal to 8. For n equals 5, if k is less than or equal to 13. Now, the interesting start, stuff starts to happen when n is equal to 6. Here we get that the Fano scheme is connected if and only if k is less than or equal to 21, or k is equal to 24. Uh, so we have some kind of non-monotonic behavior in the connectedness of these Fano schemes, and this is what happens in general. So as long as n is larger than 2, the Fano scheme um, will be connected for low values of k, and it will be disconnected for high values of k, and in between it can jump back and forth by being uh, connected and disconnected. And this is really coming from this quadratic polynomial kappa together with this uh, existence condition of some integer s. Any questions about the theorem? I'm slightly confused about your statement of the theorem. So you say k is less than or equal to kappa 0. But kappa 0 is exactly n squared minus n minus 1. Sure. So why, why did you put that kappa 0 there? Well, it somehow fits in nicely with this kappa s here. I mean, you, you can replace it in your mind if you wish. But uh, <coughs> it unifies the upper. Yeah, it, it makes, makes things look a little more uniform. Yeah. So if we didn't know your theorem ahead of time, could we have computed on the color two, for instance, the first couple of cases? Um, Is there a way to discover this? <laughs> so for maybe for um, k equals 2 and n equals 3, um, and also maybe for uh, the sort of very high values of k and n equals maybe 3, 4, or 5. But um, other than that, either you need to be very clever when you're using Macaulay 2, or I don't know how. But um, yeah, the I mean, computation becomes difficult very, very quickly. OK, so I'd like to say a couple words about the proof. Uh, so really, one key to the proof is understanding these compression spaces. Uh, so just to recall, uh, for an integer s, an s compression space uh, 
is the space of matrices which are compressing some fixed S plus one dimensional space V into an S dimensional space W. Just giving these things a name. And this is where this kappa of S is really coming from. So kappa of S turns out to be the projective dimension of any S, uh, S compression space. Of course, uh, we should keep in mind what, what values can S take. S is going to vary between zero and n minus one, right? Uh, the largest thing that I could think about compressing would be all of C to the n. So I'm compressing something uh, n minus one plus one dimensional down to something n minus one dimensional. Okay, so the nice thing about these compression spaces is that they actually fit together in a coherent way. So if I look at, so I've fixed some k, fixed some s, and I can look at the set of all k plus one dimensional subspaces uh, which are contained in some s compression space. And it turns out that these form an irreducible component of this Fano scheme. Mm -hmm. And so these are going to be somehow the components that we understand well. Uh, we're going to call them compression space components. Okay, so the other thing that we need is we need to use the fact that this Fano scheme comes with a torus action. Uh, so, of course, I can act in my space of matrices just by scaling rows or scaling columns. Uh, this preserves my determinant polynomial, so it acts on my singular space of matrices. Uh, and this induces an action on this Fano scheme as well. Okay. Uh, and this torus action turns out to be very, very nice. Uh, there are only finitely many fixed points. And... We understand exactly what these fixed points are, and they all lie on one of these compression space components. So somehow they're in this part of the, the Fano scheme that we understand. Okay. All right, because they're all coordinate. Right. Right. I mean, so they're all coordinates, but you still have to prove a lemma to show that they're they're actually in compression spaces. Yeah. I mean, this is this is yeah. Sure. This is some kind of. Yeah. Okay. So here's an example. Right. Uh, I'm looking at uh, this four-dimensional linear space of singular matrices, and uh, if I act on this space by scaling rows or scaling columns, nothing is going to change. I'm going to still have the same four-dimensional linear space of singular matrices. So this is a torus fixed point in this Fano scheme F3 of D3. And of course, we see that this is contained in a compression space, right? My um, one-dimensional space spanned by the third basis vector is being compressed down to zero. So this is contained in a zero compression space, for example. Okay, so let me give you an argument now um, which would prove that certain Fano schemes are in fact connected. So the first observation is that if I can show that just all these compression space components are connected, then my Fano scheme has to be connected. Why is this true? Well, if I take any other component, uh, it has to contain, so it's a projective variety, so it's going to have to contain one of the torus fixed points, so it has to intersect one of my compression space components. All right, so I want to just check now whether my compression space components are connected. How can I do this? Well, if two compression space components intersect, their intersection will also have to contain a torus fixed point, so what I really need to do is just check which torus fixed points are in which compress com compression spaces. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this for an example. So this is the example of four planes of singular three by three matrices. Uh, and so I've written down some torus fixed points here. These aren't all of them, but if I allow myself um, row and column permutations, then this actually gives me everything. Okay, so let's just take a look at the one uh, on the upper left. This is the one from the previous slide. Uh, we'd already seen that it was contained in an S equals zero compression space component. Uh, but it's also contained in the S equals one compression space component, right? If I take the linear space spanned by the second and third basis vectors, this is compressed down to the space spanned by the first basis vector. So it's in the S equals one component, and you can complete the rest of the picture similarly. Uh, in particular, we see that any, one, any two of these compression space components intersect, and our Fano scheme is, in fact, connected. Okay? So that what this gives you is some kind of combinatorial criterion uh, to show that certain Fano schemes are, in fact, connected. And so there's rather complicated. I mean, you saw what it was in the uh, two slides ago, but it's something that you can write down. Okay. So this is an argument to show connectedness of the Fano scheme. I guess what's happening is you, you have one or two more zeros than you would, you, that, that you would expect because your, your, dimension, your dimension is four instead of... That's five. right. That's right. And that, that allows you to fit them together. That's right. Exactly. If you uh, didn't allow yourself as many zeros as you wanted, for example, if you had a star here and a star here as well, this would only be contained in one compression space. So this is actually what we're going to see. This is behind your result, right? That's right. That's right. 
So this, is, this slide is actually the slightly more um, subtle, subtle argument. How do you show disconnectedness? All right, so in order to show disconnectedness, I claim that it suffices to exhibit the existence of a compression space component whose torus fixed points are all smooth points of the Fano scheme. Why is this true? Well, it's not difficult to see that you always have at least two irreducible components of your Fano scheme. If you have one irreducible component uh, whose torus fixed points are all smooth points, this tells you it can't intersect any other component. And so your Fano scheme has to be disconnected. I thought, it's, I thought this is just it can't intersect any other compression space. I'm confused. <coughs> so any time I have a component which intersects another component, uh, the intersection has to contain a torus fixed point. Yeah, yeah. Independ not just for Independent of compression spaces. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, this is since everything uh, has this, this torus action, uh, the torus will also act on the intersection. And yeah, any projective variety which has a torus action has, has fixed points. Exactly. Yeah, this is a fact that is. Yeah. OK, so we need to show that some compression space exists uh, whose torus fixed points are all smooth. Let's look at an example here. So now instead of looking at four planes of singular 3 by 3 matrices, we're looking at five planes of singular 3 by 3 matrices. Um, and so again, there are these three compression space components. And we've got a number of torus fixed points. Uh, these are all of them, again, up to row and column permutations. And as Frank was pointing out, we now see that each one of these torus fixed points is actually only contained in a single compression space component. Of course. This by itself isn't enough to show that the Fano scheme is disconnected. It could be that there's some other irreducible component that we don't know about that connects, say, s equals 0 and s equals 1, and another one connecting s equals 1 and s equals 2. However, in this example, it turns out that all the torus fixed points are actually smooth points in the Fano scheme, so these guys can't intersect anything else. And in fact, this tells us there aren't any other irreducible components that we didn't know about. Um, so what you have to do is you have to do some deformation theoretic calculation to calculate what the tangent space is uh, at each one of these torus fixed points and see whether or not you have a smooth point. This again gives you some criterion. And the real magic is that this agrees with what the criterion was that we had from the previous slide. A priori, this doesn't have to happen. Um, so this is something which nice which happens and we're able to get this complete characterization. OK, so let me well, not return to, but at least turn direction again and head a little bit back in the direction of complexity theory. So up till now, I've been talking about the Fano scheme of the determinant hypersurface. But of course, we can talk about Fano schemes of any hypersurface. Anytime I have a hypersurface, I can look at the set of all uh, linear spaces of some fixed dimension, which are contained in it. So we can do exactly this game for the permanent polynomial and get a Fano scheme fk of pn. And so we, uh, in our work, we study this as well. Uh, permanent. So Pn is the, the hypersurface cut out by the n by n permanent. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, please. By the way, so you, you have proved in particular that all these Fano scheme for the determinant uh, have only even rational cohomology. And the Euler Poincare is exactly the number of fixed points. You get that as a, as a, as a bonus. Oh, OK. I so wasn't aware of this. So. Mm -hmm. Rationally, integrally there may be, mm -hmm. but rationally there is no odd cohomology. And the Euler Poincare of your, uh, of your Fano scale variety is exactly the number of fixed points. Right. I mean, that's the general reject. But, but, but it's, it's highly singular. Doesn't matter. It's just because you have a torus yes, action. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yes. No, 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 no. I don't think so. I think maybe it requires smoothness because okay, you're, you're experiencing so, the tangent space. So let's maybe talk about this when I'm done. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, the case of the permanent is slightly more difficult. Um, we're still able to get a partial characterization of the connectedness uh, for these Fano schemes, but there are some sort of intermediate cases where we can't really decide. Um, there's some irreducible components which we understand well, which are sort of the analog of the compression space components in the determinantal case. Uh, and again, they, they play an important role in our um, discussion of the connectedness, but uh, somehow they're not, there aren't enough of them for us to really be able to get a complete characterization of connectedness. Um, so uh, going back to complexity theory, if you're trying to somehow show that the, the, the permanent is inherently different uh, uh, than, than the determinant, 
uh, you might want to just try and compare their Fano schemes. This would somehow be a naive thing to do. And it really appears that the Fano scheme for the permanent is much more complicated than that of the determinant. Just as an example, if you look at the Fano scheme parameterizing four-dimensional um, linear spaces in the 3x3 three three case, for the determinant, you've only got three irreducible components. We already saw what they were. For the permanent, you turn out to have 21. And their intersection behavior is pretty terrible. Uh, already, you see some non-reduced st structure there. So, um, the permanent, the stabilizer is highly non-connected. So that's right. Yeah. Is it the reason for the, which explains that you have many components? So this, this is one reason that explains why you get many components. But there are some other components that crop up that seem kind of mysterious that we don't understand very well. How, how do the dimensions vary? Um, so at least if you're looking at high-dimensional linear spaces, um, the dimension in the determinantal case is larger than the dimension in the permanent case. Um, so some other point is if I take uh, a maximum compression space, um, I can deform this. Um, but if I take, uh, say, This linear space here, so this six-dimensional linear space, is also um, in the hypersurface cut out by the three-by-three three three permanent. This doesn't deform within the permanent at all. So it's a, so it's a, so it's a single, single point. So in fact, um, if I look at uh, F... Uh, my, my question was how the dimensions of these components vary in the permanent and versus the determinant. Right, and so what I said was that at least when k is large relative to n, the dimension for the permanent is much higher than the dimension for the, uh, sorry, the dimension for the determinant is much higher than the dimension for the permanent. And when it's very small, do you know? So we conjecture, so right, so when, when k is equal to one, then we know what the dimension is for all the components in, in the determinant case. That's the expected dimension, and we conjecture that it's the same is true for the permanent. Uh, we know that this is true when n is equal to three and four, but um, don't know for higher values of n. So this is an interesting question. And do you have a conjecture about the growth rate of the number of components for the permanent? Um, so when k is large relative to n, we know what all of them are. Uh, but for intermediate values of k, uh, we, we really have no idea. Um, for k equals uh, 1, again, we would conjecture that you have exactly n components. But sort of in the intermediate range, we don't know. OK, so this is one connection back to uh, this GCT program. Um, let me maybe, on this last slide here, talk about something slightly more naive. Um, so any time I have a form of degree d, its product rank is just the smallest, uh, smallest natural number r, such that I can write f as a sum of r products of linear forms. Okay, so this is some other notion of rank, similar to rank of a tensor or similar to wearing rank, slightly different though. Okay. So we might act, ask, well, what's, what's the product rank of the permanent? Uh, so there's a formula due to Glynn, which lets you write the 3 by 3 permanent as a sum of uh, four products of linear forms. So we know that the product rank is less than or equal to four. And I claim that the product rank is actually equal to 4. Uh, so I want to use uh, some argument involving the Fano scheme F5 of P3 to show that the product rank cannot, has to be larger than 3. Um, so there are probably many other arguments you can use. Uh, the reason that I'm presenting this is, is to, to illustrate that considering Fano schemes might be useful in other similar questions involving rank. Okay. All right, so what's the argument? So let's suppose, so, so maybe I should preface this by saying that we know exactly what this, um, uh, this Fano sch scheme F5 of P3 is. So we've seen one point which is inside it. Here's another point which is inside it. So I can just take this thing here. And of course, I could have zeroed out different rows or columns. And so this gives me six points in this Fano scheme. And this is, in fact, everything. Okay, so we want to use this knowledge to our advantage. All right, so let's suppose that we can write the 3 by 3 permanent as a sum of three products of linear forms. 
there are, so I have nine linear forms that are appearing here, these Lij, and there are two cases which can occur. Either they can be linearly dependent or not. Now, if they're linearly dependent, and I look at the Fano scheme of the hypersurface cut out by this polynomial, it's not difficult to see that any maximal linear space contained in this hypersurface is going to contain some, some common line. Right? Uh, but, of course, this is not true for this Fano scheme here, so these Fano schemes are different, hence the permanent cannot be written like this. So we've eliminated this case. Now let's assume that, uh, in fact, um, these Lij are all linearly independent. Let's again look at the Fano scheme now of um, six planes in this hypersurface. How can I get a, uh, what's one way of producing a six plane? Well, for each term in the sum, I can zero out exactly one of the Lij's. Okay, so this gives me three times three times three different ways of producing six planes contained in this hypersurface, which tells me that my Fano scheme has at least 27 points, but I know that it only had six points. So this is also impossible. Um, so of course, there are probably easier ways of, of showing this fact, um, but similar arguments I'm hoping might be applicable in other situations where you don't. When you talk to computer scientists, you should tell them you have a lower bound for the smallest step three circuit of the permanent. Okay, so this gives a lower bound for the smallest step three circuit of the permanent. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah. So on, on that note, let me let me stop. So Thanks. Zero dimension. Yes. 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 I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. So in fact, um, this this is always true. So if I look at um, f, f n squared minus n minus one. That's right. So if I look at f n squared minus n minus one of p n, uh, this is always equal to uh, two n points. And it's exactly these things here. Okay, so that's it. Thanks. Probably that argument generalizes the lower bound. So in the in the three by three matrix case, there's this extra vector space of linear um, of singular matrices, mm -hmm. skewed three by three. Yeah. Where does it fit into your picture? Yeah, so this is interesting, right? Because if I look at um, just planes of singular matrices, uh, somehow it's not appearing anymore, right? So of course, anytime I have one of uh, something which is, is uh, one of these linear spaces coming from this skew symmetric matrix, um, I can look at a, a two-dimensional subspace of that, and the question is, well, what component do I land on? And the answer is, well, I had three choices of components, right? I had the zero compression spaces, the one compression spaces, and the two compression spaces. So I have to end up in the middle. That's the only choice. Um, so that's where that component fits into the picture. Um, I'm not sure exactly what else you were asking. But. So, so, that's, sorry, go ahead, please. So, so can your methods for the determinant be used to find new examples of unextendable linear spaces? Um, I think so far no, and I don't see I don't see an easy way of of of, of doing this using using any of the machinery that we have. Um, this would be nice, but I I'm, I'm afraid not. So does this P R of perm n grows exponentially in n? Yes. Do you know this? It should grow, yeah. right? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody well, there's, knows. A, there's, there's a lower there's bound. There's another bound of two to the n on this number. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's no lower bound. No, there's a lower bound. There's a lower bound. bound. Yeah, but not a good linear bound. Maybe well, not a good linear bound. Sorry, the Kayan, right, right, right. Uh, I see. The, the, the but it should be expected that it's, it's exponential. Yeah. Isn't this homogeneous sound? Right? Isn't this exponential? So, we have low bound. Yeah, yeah, for homogeneous. I see. Uh -huh. There was another question. Yeah. And do you, do you try the symmetric determinant? Because uh, it would be interesting to know if probably it's the simplest case, uh, mm -hmm. if there are only compression uh, space component. Uh, that could be maybe a, a guess. Uh, yeah, so th this question has been on my radar, but I, but I have not thought about it. Yeah. Why is it called Fano's scheme? Uh, it's named after the uh, Italian mathematician Fano. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I, I don't. Is, does anyone have a better explanation than this? There's some also funnel scheme can mean. There's also uh, funnel funnel varieties, and so I mean, so there's there is a connection. Mini mini funnel schemes are in fact funnel varieties. <laughs> So funnel schemes, the all funnel? No, no. I mean, so these are these are not. I mean, not even varieties. Often, right? They're and not irreducible. But. Let's take the reduced varieties. Let's take the reduced. Ah, component. okay. Yeah, yeah. So then you can genuinely ask. Right? Yeah, no. So this, this is a good question, and um, we don't know the answer, but uh, so so we know. Um, so when say. Uh, n is 3 and k is 5, um, we know all the components which occur, and these are all Fano, both in the determinant and in the permanent case. Um, in general, these compression space components that you get, well, uh, as long as they're non-singular, what they are, are they're, they're, they're Grassmann bundles over Grassmannians, but um, for low values of k, then they become singular. So I don't know if they're Fano then as well or not. This open question of the determinantal complexity of the three by three permanent. You know. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, could yes. So this this uh, this. Uh, hopefully, but I haven't. Uh, I haven't been able to do anything so far, but I'm I'm still thinking about this. So from what you said, it should be possible in principle to guess the existence of any component from the local structure of the fixed point of the torus. Deformation theory. To, to guess what? The existence. If you want to detect because. Possible. Oh, if you want to uh, detect the existence of uh, additional components, this is right. Yeah. So you, you exactly. So yeah. So maybe. Um, so well, it, it gets very, <laughs> it gets very complicated, and, and the problem is somehow. I mean, these are the worst points of the Fano scheme, right? In general, you have this non-reduced structure, and so you start. Um, you start computing things on Macaulay 2 or whatever, and it, it just blows up. So um, for n equals 3 and n equals 4, you can usually compute stuff. But these are the cases where we already know everything anyways. Um, for n equals 5, maybe if you're a little more clever, something might still be possible. But uh, I haven't had any success so far to find something else. Okay, another question. Well, thanks again.